So new finding out, or finding out as I usually call it. Probably some of you use this book and probably many of you have heard of it, but in actual fact, it, over the years, it has received not a lot of promotion, really. You know, from time to time, maybe every couple of years or so, I give a, um, a presentation on it somewhere, but it, it say at an expo or something like that, but it, it really, it had, there's no kind of sales staff out there visiting schools or promoting it actively or anything like that. And yet somehow, despite that, over a period of time, it has sold oh, um, somewhere between two and three million copies, which is a lot. Um, I never imagined it would when I first um, uh, wrote it, but that's the reality. And it hasn't been really because of promotion. It has been really because it, it works in the classroom. It's, uh, you know, it's mostly word of mouth and reputation. When I say it works in the classroom, it doesn't work in every classroom. It, you know, every course book is suitable for some kind, kind of classes and not suitable for other kinds. And New Finding Out is really suitable for children who don't have much time to learn each week. So it's suitable for a sort of once a week class, twice a week class, or a little bit more maybe, but that kind of lesson. So if you're teaching less than that or more than that, it's probably not suitable. So if you're teaching like once a month, it's probably not suitable because the children won't be able to keep up with the reading and writing. And if you're teaching uh, in an immersion program, it wouldn't be suitable because it's a different style of teaching. Some of you probably teach in immersion programs in the daytime and then maybe have an after school class in the evening and know how different it is. Teachers who use methodology which is appropriate for an immersion program often um, get frustrated in after school classes because you know the needs of the students are quite different and the students don't seem to be making progress. And the same applies in the other way around. Teachers who, who teach in a once a week kind of class and then get a job in an, in an immersion school often find the transition very difficult. It's, it's, a different, it's a different approach. And finding out is appropriate for the, um, the after school class or the once a week um, you know, in language school class or something like that, or twice a week, three times a week possibly, but probably not more than that. It's also the age range it's suitable for. It's, it's any, anywhere in elementary school is okay. And, and children starting at any grade of elementary school is fine because it doesn't really depend on which grade they're in. It depends on their English ability. You know, if they're, if they're beginners in third grade, then they should start on finding out book one. If they are beginners in the first grade, they should start on finding out book one. It's the same. It can also be used at the end of kindergarten if the children have studied a bit of English before. I've often used this in the last year of kindergarten, but only with children who've had experience with English in, in the first one or two years of kindergarten, then they're ready for it. But children who go straight into it in kindergarten with no English before will find it difficult. One, one thing, of course, is the, because of the emphasis on writing, the younger children find that difficult. Um, because it, it's, it has all four skills in the course. It's interesting, those of you who have been in um, Japan a long time will know that finding out played a significant role in uh, supporting a lot of teachers in Japan indirectly. There are many things which wouldn't have been possible without this course. I mean, ETJ wouldn't have been possible. The Expos wouldn't have been possible. Uh, the Birmingham University MA programs um, in Japan wouldn't have been possible. There's many other things which came because of the kind of credibility from this course. So it's, you know, just for interest, it's played a significant role. I, I certainly couldn't have done a lot of things I've done if this course hadn't been published. But that's history. What's important now is, you know, its relevance and whether it still is at the cutting edge of, of, um, of, language teaching, English teaching for children, and whether it's still innovating. And 
I want to try to show today that definitely it is both in this presentation and in another one at 250 where I'll be talking about some of the um, especially on the, some of the newer developments. I think that the the first key point about finding out is it wasn't developed to be published. It was developed for my schools a long time ago. It actually was developed through a trial and error process over, over 10 years with many great teachers who gave me feedback, constant feedback and criticism and um, it went through that, that uh, phase and it definitely came out of the needs of, the, of this, the classroom, which is why I think it has survived and still does very well, um, you know, because basically it came out of the, the, of the classroom, which many of us are teaching in. So it's relevant. You know, most most course books, which are developed by, especially by major publishers, are not developed that way. Um, they are commissioned by a publisher. A publisher will decide we need a course book for elementary school children, and and it will, you know, it will be, and and somebody will be assigned people, or or one or more people will be assigned to write it. And it, there'll be a lot of market research, of course, you know, looking at other course books and thinking, well, you know, what things work in other popular course books and that kind of thing. And also the publisher will use resources that they've published in other books and this kind of thing. And I can understand the logic of that, but it leaves me a bit cold. I, I like books which come directly out of the classroom, whether it's my book or other books. I don't want to say that my book is the only book which works. Of course it isn't. I'm just saying it works. It's one of the books which works. But another issue is that many, most major course books are developed to be sold in, in, in more than one country, because of course they need to be to, to justify the, um, the, expen the, the money which is spent on, on producing them. So they're, they're actually a book for Japan will also be sold in, in, in Korea and China and, and various other countries. And, and that makes sense from a lot of points of view, but unfortunately the situation in the classroom is often very different in these other countries. And so compromises need to be made. You know, I, I certainly, um, um, you know, the situation in Korea, which is now is, is quite different in many ways from the situation in the classroom in Japan. This finding out is developed for the classroom in Japan. It came out of the, the, the needs of the classroom here. Um, some of you, know my history I don't want to go into into detail only the bit which is relevant to this is that when I I started my school I had I started in, a, in an apartment and had um had 25 students or so yeah it was about 25 and then after about 12 years the school had um about I had, well, I had about 50 full-time staff and about the same again in franchises in Korea and Thailand. That growth was phenomenal, obviously, and it was totally fueled by the course for elementary school children, which became Finding Out. It was this, this course which drove that growth. So I can say, you know, without doubt that it works. And it, not only it works, but it, it works with the parents because that growth wasn't possible unless the parents liked what I was doing, <laughs> what the school was doing. And so a big part of this is getting, making real progress with the children. And also the parents need to be able to see that the children are making real progress. So let's talk a little bit about the course in detail. First of all, finding out has five levels. The artist, by the way, is a is a famous artist in the UK of a children's material. Um, Chris Riddell. He's also a political cartoonist. Um, he, he's uh, those of you who from from the UK may recognise his name. You see him in a lot of newspapers. He's especially, I think, he writes for the Economist, the Observer, and and um, I mean, he draws pictures for those those um, um, newspapers. And he's written some. He's um, illustrated some great children's material. Okay, and each level has kind of main core components. There's a class book, which is this one, which, oh, <laughs> sorry, that wasn't supposed to happen. 
the class book, um, which uh, is obviously for use in the class. And I'll show you some pages in a minute. The home book, which is for use between classes. The, the readers, the reader actually is for the first four levels. Um, the fifth level, by that time, the children should be able to read a, 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 a wide variety of things. And the flashcards. The flashcards are, yeah, I mean, really necessary because it's so many of the activities involve these flashcards and they make a big, if you don't have the flashcards, it, it certainly weakens the program. Those are the, the main components. Now, there are lots of support materials, which I'm going to be talking about at 2.50 today. So I'm not going to go into all of the details, but just to say there are a lot of things like for the parents or for online games and all of this kind of stuff and um, new interactive worksheets. But one thing, um, let me just try and put this in the chat, just in case you don't have this, you don't know this link. Okay, here we are. Right. That is the, um, I just sent a link to the download site. On the download site, you can see there are a lot of free downloads. The teacher's books are free downloads. The teacher's books are written for um, less experienced teachers, and they're written for teachers who haven't used the, used um, finding out very much before. So more for more um, advanced users, I would suggest watching my um, videos on, on YouTube. Uh, where there's lots of um, videos which um, show how to do things in a more advanced way. And I've just shown a, put a, posted a link to the YouTube channel. And on, on that YouTube channel, you can see videos on child-centered learning, on teaching writing, on teaching listening, on teaching um, on games-based learning. Many of these things, it's actually um, all part of the, the the approach used in finding out, but just use doing it at a more advanced level than, than actually in the teacher's book. But the teacher's book is is free and it gives, you know, obviously it's is useful, especially for the descriptions of the activities and and um, ideas for teaching the songs and this kind of thing. There are two audios, both of which are free downloads. One of which also is a CD which comes with the class book. It's what's called My CD. My CD is for extensive listening uh, between lessons. And then there is the, the class audio, which is for the, the audio for inside the classroom, which is exactly what's in the, in, in the class book. The My CD, the kind of home listening, is not just what's in the class book. There's a lot of extra stuff, which is just basically background listening. We want the parents to play this in the car or play it in the background, songs and fun fun activities, which uh, expose the children to expose the children to the English, which is relevant to the course. There are small flashcards, which are free downloads. There are progress reports, both in English and in Japanese for the parents assessment for the teacher for various stages of the books, certificates, games resources, and, and that kind of thing. This is just an overview. I'm going to be going into some of this stuff in a little bit more detail in the, in the at 250. There are also online games for the children, um, lots and lots of games, which I will demonstrate in, at 250 in that, in the presentation. So, Let's get into the course. There are four, four issues which finding out tries to address, and I believe successfully addresses. Uh, four issues which are normally faced when teaching elementary school children in Japan, especially when the children don't have very much time to, to learn English each week. The first issue is, of course, the writing system. Um, that the 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 um Japanese children have a different writing system. I mean, it's a given that any course for Japanese children must address this issue. And yet so often I see schools using courses which are actually developed for European children, you know, especially phonics programs and this kind of thing, which I, I, I mean, absolutely, let's use phonics, but let's use it in a, in a way that is 
um, comes out of the needs of Japanese children rather than British children or American children or European children. So um, the writing system. I'm going to demonstrate how um, how this is approached in you finding out in, in a little bit. The second issue which needs to be addressed is the distance from English. What I mean by that is that Japanese children come into a, a class, English class from a different world. A different world where they're surrounded by English, where where you know, um, sorry, where they're, they're surrounded by Japanese, where there's very little English in their environment. This is this is a this is a big this is a big issue. Um, you know, it's actually this is one of the differences between the situation in the Japan, Japan and the situation in many countries. In many countries, there is more English around those children outside the class. This is also another reason why. That there's a big difference between teaching children once a week and teaching children in an immersion program, because in an immersion program, they don't suffer from the children don't have this problem so much. But in but in a, in children who are studying once a week or twice a week, need to um, we need to face this this issue. It's a really big one. How do we deal with it? The biggest way to deal with it is to teach in a child centered way draw the children into the class, bring the children in, don't impose lessons on the children, draw the children in, fully engage the children. Now, I this is what I normally present on, and I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours, so I won't because that's not the topic of today. And many of you have seen my presentations on child-centered learning um, anyway. What I will say is this, finding out means the children discover. That's what that's what the book means. It's it's it means that the children find out there's there's a sequence of language which the children discover. The children are scaffolded through uh, uh, a, 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 a sequence of language which comes out of the needs of a Japanese Japanese classroom, which is extensively classroom researched. Um, my academic background is in in social psychology, specializing in child development. And my main interest is in, is in constructivist psychology. This is a constructivist approach. And those of you who have seen my presentations on this will be very familiar with the methodology needed to, to draw the children into a class and fully engage them. A second issue that we often need to face is the parent's confidence. What I mean by that is that you may be teaching children and then the parents may decide, well, that's very nice and that's fun and everything. But let's um, after a while, they may think, well, now is the time for the child to go to the Juku or something like that. In other words, the parents need to believe in what you're doing. And they need to also, if you want, if you're if you've got a school, for example, or, if you're, or you're teaching freelance, you, you want the parents to be able to tell other parents and you need to you want to have more and more students now. This is a big was a big part of what finding out did for my own schools, and of course there are lots of things with lots of factors which have an effect on this. But if I could if I could identify one key factor, which I believe was the 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 magic factor, if you like, and that was the effectiveness of finding out for developing the children's writing ability. Now. That is because writing is the most visible skill. If the children can speak in class, that's great. But when they go home, many of them don't speak. If they can listen, that's fine. But it's very difficult for parents, to, especially busy parents, to see what the children are listening to. If they can read, that's better, because that's a bit more visible. But it's you know if the if the parents can see the children interested in reading books, that that's great. That's really good. But the, the biggest thing of all, the most visible skill of all is writing. When children are right, everybody can see if they're making progress or not. The teacher can see it, the children can see it, the parents can see it. If the children every week they're taking home writing and every week that writing is getting better and better and better and better and better, little by little, but always getting better, the parents have confidence in you. That is the magic thing. And finding out is really effective, I, I believe, for developing children's writing skills. And so we will we will um, look at that in a minute. How are we doing for time? We're fine. 
And the last point, the biggest one of all, is the lack of time. Finding out is, is designed for um, children who don't study English very much. Once a week, twice a week, that's the ideal situation for using finding out. So this one we need to look at in a bit more detail. Retention. How do the children retain language when they are learning only once a week or twice a week? How is that possible? Um, well, again, I think there are a number of factors. I identify five. First factor is balance of skills. One skill supports another skill. If the children go to an English conversation school and only learn listening and speaking, unfortunately, I'm sorry, it's not deep enough. Uh, retention is not enough. In an immersion program, yes, children can learn through speaking, especially if children go home or, or have friends who speak English, yes, they can learn through speaking. They can retain language through speaking. But if children are learning once a week or twice a week, focusing too much on listening and speaking and not enough on reading and writing leads to low retention. They can memorize things, but deeply retaining language and building their language skills step by step on it over a period of time, no, it's, it's not effective enough. They need all four skills and they need all four skills to be reasonably balanced. Reading deepens speaking and writing deepens speaking and reading. Writing is the most difficult skill. And so partly because of that, it is the deepest. It's a time when children really need to think. So all four skills support each other. You know, if the children learn too much reading and writing and not enough speaking, that leads to in, an imbalance too. So it's all four skills play a key role in retention. The second thing is constant review. We can't have like, you know, today, this, this week is this week's language target and next week is next week's language target. That doesn't lead to retention. The children need to be building language, always mixing the old and the new, the old and the new. And finding out does that through the games, through the activities, which constantly do that. And, you know, it's like, a, especially, um, you know, the, one of the reasons I said the flashcards are important because in flashcards, you can, you can mix in the old flashcards and the new flashcards very easily in the activities in the games constant recycling, constant review in the activities. Building always a new thing is, is connected with the old thing. The third point is framework. If, if knowledge is learned in isolation, it's very difficult to retain. Children need to connect one item of knowledge with another item of knowledge. Grammar is important for doing this. Grammar provides a framework which helps children to make guesses about new things that they encounter. And I don't mean grammar as it is traditionally taught. I don't think there should be any grammatical terms. I don't think grammar should be explained. I think grammar should be encountered through the activities, through the games. It's in the syllabus. The, the, the syllabus fits together in a grammatical sequence, but this doesn't need to be explained to the children. It just needs to be there so that children can acquire knowledge which fits together well. The second framework is phonics. Rather than learning words in isolation, phonics provides a framework which enables children to make guesses so that they can read and write new words. Phonics is, is to be honest, in a once a week or twice a week situation in Japan, phonics, I think, is the only approach to reading and writing which really works. Uh, I've tried uh, in the past other methods, but they just they don't there's not the time available to use those methods successfully. And the fourth framework is, of course, again, the skills, one skill supporting another skill, listening, speaking, reading and writing together provide a framework, not just approaching thing from one direction, but approaching the same knowledge, the same words, the same structures from various directions deepens the understanding of those, um, uh, deepens the retention of those words and patterns. The last uh, but one point is ownership. If children have ownership of language, they're more likely to retain it. 
Ownership comes from teaching in a child-centered way. We want children to encounter things, wonder about them, go, huh, what's that? Oh, I see, they discover it. Rather than receive it from the teacher, they discover it through play. They discover it through puzzles. This is what finding out focuses on. Every time new language targets are introduced through games, through puzzles, where um, the children encounter while playing. It's not explained to them before they play. They, they encounter them while playing. And then at the end, they discover it and they feel, yes, I did that. And that's ownership. Those children are much more likely to retain language and they're much more likely to, be go, to go home and be motivated to, to, to be interested in, 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 in language, in English. And the last point is for retention, if you've got children only in class once a week or twice a week, they need to be able, they need to do things between classes. Not a lot because everybody's busy, but they need to do things. And they need to have things which the children want to do between classes. Of course, the home book helps, but also things like the listening in the car, the online classes, the, I'm sorry, the online games. And, and um, also, when we teach in a child-centered way, we are motivating children to be interested in English rather than just to receive it from the teacher. And those children are much more likely to go home and... Um, and be interested in English and, and do things for themselves. So focusing on self-motivation is important, which finding out does. Okay, let's look at some sample units. First, I'm not gonna do a, a unit from every book, uh, every level, it would take too long and it'd be a bit boring. So I just do um, three sample units from different levels of the course. Book one, the opening page of a unit is always a multi-skill uh, target. It's always what they can hear, what they can say, what they can read, and what they can write at this stage. This is right at the beginning, so all they can um, write is, is the letters. Writing is the most difficult skill, so you could say that on this page it defines what they can write at this stage, and they learn it through anchor words like tiger, the dog, ga gorilla, ca cat, they, they learn the, the pronunciation, they learn the, the reading, and they learn the writing, and they, they learn it through, through games. But this is like the first, each, each unit has six pages. The first, this is the first three units, of three pages of this unit. So you can see on the first page, on the first page, um, this defines what they can write at this stage. But on the second page, then these are not things they can write yet, but they obviously need language which they can only, only say at this stage. In this case, they're learning counting, they're learning vocabulary, which they learn through simple patterns like what is it? It's a, um, it's a bed or it's a dog. And then it's a game. So in book one, the first page of a unit defines what they can write. There also needs to be a lot of spoken only language, which okay. is great and necessary. But from a long-term point of view, it's what they can read and write as well as speak, which matters. So gradually, I, I just muted everybody. <laughs> okay, right. So getting back from it. So as the course develops, um, it's not so necessary to have language targets which are only spoken because gradually their reading and writing improves. And, and after a while, they should be able to read and write everything which is in the book. But at the beginning, obviously, they can't because they can only write the letters. And then the fourth, the, the, the fourth, fifth and sixth um, pages of the unit are, in this case, exercises, a song and, uh, and a, a further exercise. These are, these are exercises for the classroom. And of course, in the home book, which is a homework book, they have further exercises which is based, based on letter formation. The home book does emphasize writing more than everything else. This is what's especially also um, something, you know, writing is something they can easily do at home. Uh, while speaking is, is obviously you know, they, they, more difficult to do at home. But let's move on. So book three, uh, sample unit. And it's the same basic format. The, the opening page of a book 
defines what they can write at this stage. So in this case, they're writing question and answers with ing, um, you know, um, so present continuous. And the first three pages of the unit, they're, they're writing uh, on, this is what they can write, but um, these, then they're, they're talking about each other, they're, 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 they're introducing each other, but they, they can say whatever the children are capable of saying about each other at this stage. There's vocabulary. These, these can be written as well as spoken. There's a game. The games, of course, you know, these are just suggestions. There are, you know, every class and every teacher will have different preferences, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of games in the book. And the fourth, fifth, and sixth play game, this, they're playing, they're, they're, they're doing activities with can and can't. Some classes will be able to write these sentences and some classes won't. So I haven't prescribed that it should be written, but it, of course it can be. And then there's exercises and just homebook. And the, this is book five, a sample unit. In this case, the uh, opening page defines, again, what they can write as well as speak. In this case, they're just asking, they're combining a lot of questions like, what do you do? I'm a student. They did occupations in book two. What school do you go to? Monsterland Elementary School. How do you go to school? By helicopter. So the new language target is actually transportation, extending more extensive conversations about transportation um, but in, in this particular unit. But you can see at this stage, they're able to read and write um, longer dialogues. And um, on the second page, they, they have, um, this is the opening page. The second page has, you know, different types of, has different types of transportation. There's a game. One of the, the characters in this book is that monster. Um, so snakes and monsters is an appropriate game. There's a story in each level, by the way. And um, then they're doing more, um, you know, more with transportation. How far is it? How do I get to? These are kind of fairly standard questions related to transportation. There is a song related to transportation and an exercise. Okay. I'm going to do one more thing and then we'll have a, a, a question answer session. I know there's not a lot of time, so I will try to, I'm trying to go through this quite quickly, as you can tell by this, my, the way, my speed. <laughs> I'm talking too fast, but never mind. Okay. Let's look at the, the, the progression from, from phonics to stories. The starting point, this is book one, unit one. And what the the opening page is the vowels, a apple, a elephant, a igloo, a octopus, and a umbrella. And using the anchor words for, for the model pronunciation. So however you pronounce the first um, sound of apple, um, that's how you pronounce a, and that's how the children will pronounce it. Or you can use the um, the audio as a model if you prefer. So in the first lesson, children coming into the first lesson, possibly with no English or, or um, little reading and writing, and they come across a, e, i, o, a. And of course, Japanese children can relate to that because it's failed. They've, the children feel, oh, wow, English is the same as Japanese. You know, I mean, it's instead of what one of the thing, principles about one of the important points about, I think, constructive psychology is that the children are always build on where what they have already. It's not like suddenly do something different. It's always like a building, 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 scaffolding from where the children are now. So when the children enter the classroom, they have Japanese language. We can't assume they have any English. So when they learn a, a, e, or a, a, apple, a, elephant, and so on, that feels familiar. And that feeling of familiarity is really important. It gives them confidence to, to um, move forward. And then, of course, we need to go into the, into, the, into the consonants. And the consonants are introduced over, a, um, over a, a few units, because I do like four or five at a time. And then the next stage is joining the vowels and consonants. 
So they need to learn that at is not at, but at. And that they play and play and play games. And so until they do this, this stage is pretty important. And the next stage is joining um, CVC, consonant, vowel, consonant. So um, again, this is a, a pretty fundamental stage and um, for pronunciation, for reading and for writing. Um, so all of this is 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 um, introduced in a step-by-step -step way. And then they move on to longer words. But if you notice that so far, only the short vowels have been introduced because the, the focus is not on knowledge, it's on skill. I think there's a, a often, I think phonics can easily become a kind of mathematics, you know, where it's, it's you know, it's like it becomes like a, a logical exercise or often with too much input for Japanese children. I think when you're teaching children once a week, the important thing is to minimize your knowledge, maximize the skill, maximize the manipulation. So the children are, are, um, learning how to use what knowledge they have, and um, both for reading and for writing, and of course for pronunciation. And then the next step is to introduce special sounds like e tree or e seal or ch chicken. And not a lot, they don't and they need to, don't need to be every every possible combination because again it's not mathematics, and the 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 it just needs to be enough to give the children the confidence to read. And then after that, you can introduce more sounds in context. Um, so using more of a, what's called a top-down approach, more of a whole, a whole language approach. But so in, in, in finding out, there's about um, 25 or so special combinations. And I think that's enough to introduce in this way, in this sort of, um, uh, bottom, what's called a bottom-up approach. And then in book two, the children, that was all from book one. Book two, the children are beginning to put things together. Of course, they can, they can read and write sentences in book one, but only very basic ones. But in book two, they're beginning to develop different sentence patterns, and then they put them into um, short stories. So you have something like this. Hello, I'm Fred. I'm an animal. I'm not a gorilla. I'm not a snake. And these things are these passages are designed to be read, but they're also designed to be spoken and to be written. So Akiko can stand up and say, "Hello, I'm Akiko. I'm a girl. I'm not a banana." And so it can be personalized. And then Akiko can go home, and for homework, she can write her own her own uh, write about herself using this reading passage as a framework. So in this way. It's multi-skill. One skill inter interlinks with another skill, and it's deeper than just treating a, um, a skill in like reading in isolation. In um, book three, from book three onwards, all of the reading passages are about children in different countries around the world. So this provides an opportunity for children to become, you know, for you to do things related to these countries. So in this case, good morning. This is early in book three. Good morning, I'm Carmen. I live in Madrid in Spain. So again, Akiko can say, good morning, I'm Akiko. I live in, I don't know, wherever, Hiroshima in Japan kind of thing. So this is uh, it's for always personalizable. And then as the course develops, these reading passages become longer and more complicated, like... Um, I'm Rana, I'm from Egypt, I live in an apartment in Cairo, I live with my father, my mother, my grandfather, and my grandmother. So again, this is totally personalizable. The, the Japanese child, like Akiko, can stand up and say the same thing about herself, and she can go home and she can write a story about herself using this as a model. And this is from uh, book five. You can get the idea. So we have five minutes for questions. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay. There's a there's a question here from Ian Clark. I wonder how sight words or uh, aggressed in the new finding out paradigm. Yeah. So if you if you are teaching children like once a week or twice a week, um, sight words can definitely be learnt, but in order for them to be learnt, they need to be recycled a lot. So if you introduce if you introduce a sight word like once or twice and then expect the children to learn it they're not going to be able to they can learn phonics that way because they're building a framework they're building a skill 
So, but you can't learn sight words that way. So if you do introduce the sight words, you need to make sure they see it a lot. To give an example of that, in book one, the sentence, what is it? Well, isn't it a phonically regular, but what is not? So what is introduced a lot? They see what all the time. In that way, they can, they can learn it. So in, in the early stages, the aim is to give the children confidence. Always to, so that's why there aren't many sight words earlier on, because we want the children to, we want, always want the children to feel, yes, I can do it. Not English is difficult. So, and then, um, but if you feel that the children are ready to learn more sight words, that's no problem. But if you do introduce sight words, just make sure they see them frequently. That's all. Um, another question here is, should writing be a large or small part of a lesson? A big thing about writing is um, it needs to be regular. Rather than it being a lot, it needs to be regular. If you, if you do no writing for a few weeks and then a lot of writing, it doesn't work. You always have to do a little bit of writing, especially when in the early stages, like if they're, um, you know, book one or book two, I would say always do some writing. You can give, if the children will do their homework regularly, then you can give most of the writing for them to do for homework, but you always need to do a little bit in write in, in, in class, even if it's just to show them what they need to do for homework. You know, they need to be able, they need to know what they need. They need to have enough confidence to be able to do their homework. So I, I actually, in the early stages, would always do at least, I would do about 10 or 15 minutes of writing in a lesson and then the rest of it for homework. And it would always be a, a kind of launching pad for their homework. Later on, as I, as I, I in, you know, develop a relationship with the children more and more, I can trust them to do almost all the writing for homework and I don't have to do so much in class. Okay, how do our books based on the students' years? Um, the, 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 on the students' grades, it doesn't have to be related to grade. The most important thing is English ability. So if the children are starting in grade one, then book one should be for grade one. If they're starting in book three, then book one should be for grade three. If you're teaching privately or, and you combine children from different grades, that's okay up to a point. If you put, I wouldn't combine a first grader with a fourth grader, but I would, a first grader with a third grader is probably okay. So within a couple of grades each, of each other, it's okay. If you're teaching at a school, which is formally related to the, you know, where the grades are taught separately, then as I said, it depends on um, whether they can read and write. If they can't read and write, they need to start from book one. It's the foundation of the program. Okay, I'm, I run out of time. so. We're going to have a short break now, and then um, after that, Ryan Haglund will give a presentation. And after that, I will give a presentation on new developments we're finding out. And there's, there's some quite exciting new things which have been happening. And then at the end of the day, we'll have a discussion on this. So thank you very much for listening. I was racing through that presentation. <laughs>